We're here to talk about rheumatoid arthritis. <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic multi-organ disease with a predilection to joints. And I say it's a, a systemic multi-organ disease because uh, it does involve the whole body. And um, constitutional symptoms, nodules, ocular, vasculitis, pulmonary, cardiac, GI, pretty much any system is involved in rheumatoid arthritis. And furthermore, <coughs> These non-articular manifestations of disease can in fact be the presenting feature of the disease. So therefore, I tend to look at it as a multi-organ disease which has a predilection for the joints because clearly the name rheumatoid arthritis implies arthritis. So for the general person, there's two types of arthritis. There's wear and tear or osteoarthritis and then there's inflammatory which is when your body mounts a response against itself causing inflammation. So that's rheumatoid. The problem with just saying, oh, okay, there's two types of arthritis, is there's about 150 mimics of rheumatoid arthritis. And somewhere along this uh, lecture, I will get to the slides, and I'll try to go through them in a systemic fashion and show you that gout, psoriatic arthritis, sarcoid with arthritis, any of the other spondyloarthropathies, reactive arthritis, ankylosis, spondylitis, and even in some cases osteoarthritis, and a host of other conditions can mimic rheumatoid arthritis. And in fact, to go one step further, a positive rheumatoid factor, which everybody oh, I have arthritis and I have a positive rheumatoid factor, I must have rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, there's about 10 things that one can quickly name that cause arthritis and a positive rheumatoid factor. So we should discuss those things too, because this is very important that one knows. Without the knowledge that I'm going to give you, everybody will just assume that a computer can say the patient has arthritis, they have a positive rheumatoid factor, hence they have rheumatoid arthritis, put them on a biologic drug and everything will be fine. Well, that definitely is not the way it works. Um, so since I'm doing good without the slides, I'll kind of keep talking because that seems to be when I'm in my wheelhouse and doing my best is just talking because I'm not a good listener or a reader, I just talk. <laughs> um, so let, let's just go, I'll make up a case, okay? And then, then I think after I make up a case and discuss it with you, then we can see how we can go into the uh, slides. So um, to make up this case, which I'm just gonna make up right now, a 50-year-old male or female, black or white, comes to your clinic and they complain of joint pain. They complain of joint pain and you get the history that their pain is inflammatory, not non-inflammatory. So what is inflammatory pain? How would you describe it? Well, the definition of inflammation would say that there is redness, tenderness, swelling, and warmth. So when somebody walks into your office, they may see those things. Or what I like to do is ask them, how do you feel in the morning? This is the key thing and I'll beat the people down until I get an answer how they feel in the morning because most people they walk in and they say I'm lousy how are you doing today I'm lousy or how are you I'm regular we've all heard this one I'm regular okay I don't know what regular means anymore so if you can get the patient to tell you that they distinctly have worse pain in the morning they were sleeping all night presumably therefore they're inflamed so if you're inflamed, now you're at least in the inflammatory category. So we push aside osteoarthritis because that's non-inflammatory. Those people wake up and say, you know, oh God, I'm really stiff. It only lasts two minutes. By the time I walk to the bathroom, if I brushed my teeth, which they may not do, um, their pain is gone. So that's the distinction between the two on the history. Okay, so the person who could actually be 20, 40, 60, 80, or 100 comes in and says, something and then you extract from them that their knuckles or their wrists or their knuckles wrists and elbows or knuckles, wrist, elbow shoulders or lower extremities toes ankles have stiffness that lasts and, and goes on and it's 30 60 90 minutes and gradually as lunch comes they're starting to loosen up maybe motrin takes the edge off maybe it doesn't so they come to you you say oh gee now I know they're inflamed. Well, okay, they're inflamed. Well, have gout, that's the most, inf that's the most common inflammatory disease. 
well, no, they don't really sound like they had gout. Well, why is that? Because the gout sounds like acute swelling and acute inflammation where my knee just swelled up and I sprained my ankle in my sleep. If you meet anyone that sprained their ankle in their sleep, they have gout, uh, unless they have sleep disturbance and they sprain their ankle in their sleep. But I haven't met one of those. Yet. If you have, that's awesome. Um, so anyway, so now you have this person who, in the ideal world, we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, which we are, has a small joint metric polyarthritis. Okay, small joint, meaning knuckles or toes, as opposed to large joints, elbow, shoulder, hip, knee, ankle, and excluding the axial skeleton. So what's the axial skeleton? It's the symph symphysis pubis, the sacroiliac joints, the sacrum, the lumbar spine, and the thoracic spine. The cervical spine, however, can be involved in rheumatoid arthritis. Not only can be, it is. It may be often overlooked, but it is. And the other mention would be the sternoclavicular joints, which are right here, well, right here under my shirt. They are definitely involved in inflammatory arthritic conditions and rheumatoid arthritis, not solely spondyloarthropathies. Okay, so now we've established that a patient has come, they've described morning stiffness, they've described inflammation, and everybody's convinced that this person with rheumatoid arthritis, I'm sorry, this person with inflammatory joint disease may have rheumatoid arthritis. So we know they don't have osteoarthritis, but they may have an osteoarthritic knee in conjunction with their inflammatory process. So you start an evaluation. The evaluation includes blood tests, it includes x-rays, it may include an MRI, it may include various things. So let's go through some other things about the case. Well, the person may say, I'm tired, I'm listless, I may have dry eyes, I may have dry mouth, I may even have occasional chest pain or breath. They have other things. They may have a rash. Okay, so you got your history, and now you're thinking more, gee, I need to have rheumatoid arthritis. What blood do I get? Well, with respect to the test in rheumatoid arthritis, as in any workup, you get a chemistry, you get a CBC, you check liver functions, um, you check directly acute phase reactants, which pro, pro, predominantly would be sed rate and C reactant protein. But I think is an important acute phase reactant. Albeit, I'll throw this in. The highest ferritins are seen in macrophage activation and also frequently uh, seemingly very high in Stills disease, but it's somewhat a misnomer if anybody would diagnose Stills disease solely based on very high ferritin. There are doctors I've worked with in other species who when they see a ferritin over a thousand, according to Stills disease, this is not the case. Stills, I mean, that's a whole other avenue, but ferritin is a good acute phase reactant. If we have a high sed rate, a high C-reactant protein, an elevated ferritin, perhaps elevated complement, perhaps an elevated platelet count, all of these testing, including an ACE level, an elevated ACE level, which you may say, oh, isn't that the test for sarcoid? Yes, it may be disproportionately elevated in sarcoid, which, by the way, may be one of those conditions with a rheumatoid factor, um, is yet another acute phase reactant. So, in my belief, these acute phase reactants would be better served as a gauge for how your treatment may be working, or they may not be important at all, except to tell you that the patient's not. If somebody with fibromyalgia supposedly has a set rate of in that situation, I'd say, gee, you really need to look for what is stewing or what in remission. Or what do they really have? Never base a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis or any other specific condition solely on acute phase reactants with very few exceptions. So then we would order a rheumatoid factor, which is an antibody. I would order a CCP, which is a um, cyclic citrinylated protein. Now, rheumatoid factor 20 years ago was the only we had that was specific for rheumatoid arthritis. And at that point in time, it was felt that 80% of people with rheumatoid arthritis have a positive 
rheumatoid factor, and the other 20% are called seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. Now we have the C antibody, which, depending on what uh, literature you look at, is almost almost percent specific for rheumatoid arthritis. I tell you um, on a case that I was reading last night for something else that they're actually out of a study that's been published in the last five years on 20 patients with infected endocarditis looking at the autoantibody production of endocarditis, which by the way is another cause of a positive rheumatoid factor, polyarthritis, one patient out of the 20 or 19 did in fact have a CCP antibody. And there are other conditions that I will I can mention uh, lupus anticoagulant, phospholipid antibody disease, lupus, hepatitis C, that will give a positive CCP antibody. But that being said, the labs usually report different ranges of CCP. If the CCP is above the upper limit of normal or the high um, for the highest level that the lab reports, that is probably 100% specific. But if it's in the moderate positive range with a positive rheumatoid factor, the clinical scenario, in those cases, I don't think you should lump them into an RA diagnosis, not so fast. Okay, so I hope you all have a picture where we're headed here. I made this case up this morning, but I'm describing an RA patient to work them up and what we're thinking about along the way. Um, what would I do next? I'd have joint x-rays, and if it's early days, the joint x-rays, um, nothing. They may show soft swelling or they may actually be normal. If it's a 20-year-old, very well may be normal except for soft tissue swelling. If it's a 60-year-old, they're going to have osteoarthritic changes, and they may have erosion, they may have periarticular demineralization, they may have other features that you would expect to see in rheumatoid arthritis, and, and a lot has to do with the distribution of joints as well. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, the sacral joints, they're usually not involved in rheumatoid arthritis, while the MCs, the metacarpal uh, phalangeal joints, they're almost always involved in rheumatoid arthritis. That being said, I'll throw out to you that I have seen rheumatoid arthritis present in a palindromic fashion or palindromic rheumatism, where it actually looks like gout, Recu uh, current acute flares and attacks of that come and go randomly for months and over several years they evolve into rheumatoid arthritis. At the beginning the rheumatoid factor may be negative, you may not know what it means, you can't find crystals, you're very confused, but the patient, look, not every disease has a name. Sometimes it takes years or decades for them evolving into a, a, or a, um, a name or a condition. The patient becomes very frustrated. You need to learn how to tread water and the patient along and explain, no, 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 I understand what you're talking about. I believe you, you have a disease. It just doesn't have a name today. The patient really doesn't get it. That's why you say, look, there's two types of arthritis. There's inflammation and there's wear and tear. And for those people, you just have inflammation. Issue, is that a rheumatoid? Okay, yeah, it's kind of like rheumatoid. You have a type of rheumatoid. But we know that's not reality. But we're appeasing the person who you need to get through to it's basically your boss. So ways to describe it, as well as our scientific ways to go about getting the history and diagnosing the patient. Uh, at that point, just, just to throw in, 95% is the history and a lot of it is the um, exam. The labs and the x-rays and the MRIs, they're, they're more for confirmation. You've heard this from every specialty, you've heard this from everybody really is true. If you take a good history, probably 80% of the time, you don't even need an exam, you don't even need blood, you don't need much. And if, with no blood and no MRI, no x-rays, you may never get an RA, but you'll certainly know it's inflammatory as opposed to non-inflammatory just by talking to them. Okay, so here's where I typically lose my train because we veered off too much and I got to try to regroup here. Um, Oh, okay. We were at uh, the point where we were going to order x-rays. So we order x-rays for the patient, and you may or may not see what you're looking for. What you're looking for uh, to confirm or help confirm your diagnosis are periarticular 
demineralization. Um, means demineralization, thinning of the bone around the joints. And the other thing for would be erosions. Uh, when you get more advanced, the erosions of gout look different than the erosions of rheumatoid arthritis. But anyway, so let's go back to the patient. The patient came in and they present to you classic history of inflammatory arthritis. Their blood is pretty negative. The rheumatoid factor is kind of on the fence. It's been going on more than six weeks. This is kind of key. Because if it's going on for like one week or two weeks and they have a kid at home, it's that it's Parvo B19 or yet another differential that looks like RA. So I will frequently have MRI of the dominant hand and wrist. Now, the MRI of the dominant hand and wrist, if it's done correctly and read correctly, will show you erosions and synovitis two years before they will ever on an x-ray. So, we know that we have a two-year window of opportunity to treat this person aggressively prior to them having destruction, demineralization, fractures, tendon ruptures, disability, and so on. And people don't need an excuse these days to get on disability if you haven't noticed. Okay, I'm supposed to laugh, but okay. Um, so, um, okay, the MRI. Uh, the, the MRI uh, with um, contrast will show synovitis. Uh, X-rays will not show synovitis. An MRI without contrast will pick up erosions that are very small and subtle, one millimeter, 1.5 millimeter, very, very small and hard to measure, but clearly if seen in the right pattern, in the right clinical scenario, can solidify and cinch your diagnosis. Now, am I saying that you should order an MRI in everybody that you think has R8? No, I'm not. But probably at the level where I am as a rheumatologist, where I get to a situation where you refer me a patient who they have inflammatory joint pain, it's going on more than six weeks, you've given them 12 hours, nothing works, or they're only a little bit better and you refer them to me, well, what am I going to do with them? Well, you've already done most of the legwork, I'm going to repeat the blood, but I'm going to repeat it with more studies. And that gets into the differential diagnosis. Because now I want to find out if this person, in fact, has rheumatoid arthritis or if they have one of the mimics of rheumatoid arthritis. So when I order my blood, I'm checking, in addition to my history, of course, I will be checking my blood tests for lupus. I'll be ordering an A and a double stranded DNA. If anybody orders a single stranded DNA, don't tell them you learned from me because this test is pretty irrelevant. Um, so ANA and DNA, if they're positive and you have a low rheumatoid factor, you probably are dealing with a lupus patient because the rheumatoid factor can be positive in lupus. In fact, it is probably 20 or 30 percent of the time. I will also order um, a rheumatoid factor with a CCP confirming my diagnosis. If I get a rheumatoid factor and a CCP that are extraordinarily high and positive, and in addition, I get a positive ANA and a DNA that are both extraordinary high and positive, that person probably has an overlap syndrome. They probably have both. There are people that can have two diseases. And especially within autoimmunity, where there is a lot of overlap, this, this may occur. And in fact, with the treatments that are available, it can actually create somewhat of confusion because some of the lupus biologics aren't necessarily good for the RA patient, while some of the RA biologics may in fact induce positive ANAs, DNAs, and lupus-like syndromes. So these are very confusing, hard to sort out. We need to look. Okay, so back to the testing. The patient came to me. Um, I ordered my ANA and DNA. I ordered my SSA and SSB. Uh, why? Because Sjogren's can also present with an inflammatory arthritis. And you might say, well, gee, Sjogren's, isn't that the one with the dry eyes and the dry mouth? Absolutely. But rheumatoid patients, one of their complications or associations is secondary SICA, S-I-C-C-A, uh, or keratin conjunctivitis SICA, which is, um, uh, in layman's terms, dry eyes and dry mouth. So most RA patients have dry eyes and dry mouth, but they don't have Sjogren's disease. They have rheumatoid arthritis with an extra-articular manifestation involving the exocrine glands causing dry eyes and dry mouth. 
And if you do suspect that it was Sjogren's, you'd send the patient for salivary flow scans and you'd send them to an ophthalmologist and ask them to do specific testing to check for Sjogren's. And then there's sarcoid. Well, I'm definitely going to get a baseline chest X-ray who, on somebody I suspect has rheumatoid arthritis. I may be looking for nodules. I may be looking for interstitial lung disease. And again, this goes to are some of the extra articular things. So when you do your workup, you may find things that are classic. But then again, you may find things that steer you to another diagnosis. And by the way, since I mentioned pulmonary nodules and since I mentioned uh, interstitial lung disease, the most common pulmonary manifestation articular pleurisy. Pleurisy, pleural effusion, this is the most common. And since we're on this topic, the most common cardiac is probably pericardial effusion, but this is a nice time to throw in something that has been brought up to my attention, perhaps that I've misled or confused people. RA patients are known to have increased coronary disease, likely on the basis of inflammation, and they have high cardiac CRP or high sensitivity CRP, and on the flip side, here's the confusing part, those same patients on biologic therapy with a TNF blocker, those patients are now at a risk. We're reducing the risk of cardiac disease as we're treating RA with a biologic drug. So the methotrexates, the prednisones, the Motrins, they can do that, but the injectable, either self-injectable or IV biologics, they do accomplish that. So there's a higher risk of coronary disease in an RA patient, just like there's a higher risk of malignancy in an RA patient. And if you do PEP in your workup, you'll see many of these people have MGUS. Some will need to go along and get bone marrow biopsy, but again, this shouldn't be a surprise knowing that there's a higher risk of malignancy in the autoimmune population. I mean, the patients kind of tell you this, but they don't know how to say it. They say, I don't want to take your drug because it's going to alter my system. But ma'am, you're here to see me, but your immune system is broken. So the, the whole thing is, is that I'm coming to you with a broken immune system, and I like to look at a medicine as a disease. The problem or good thing is that my disease that I'm giving the patient is safer than the disease they brought me. So they came in with a 50% broken immune system. I'm giving them a drug that's going to repair their immune system and break 10% of another part of it, i.e. the side effect risks. Used properly, the side effects ris risks can be monitored for, uh, and they can be dealt with as necessary. And if need be, you can stop the drug. Um, hmm. Okay. So, I think we got through a lot already. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the slides to summarize a lot of what I said, fill in some gaps, and then describe things on the pictures. Because I think the pictures, even though pictures are not as good as a live patient. I think the pictures are really a nice way where I can say, oh, look at this. This is something you see commonly, or this is something you see uncommonly, or this is. And, but it may be a good way to tie together the, the patient that I just made up um, for you. Um, OK, so assuming you can see there what I can see here, we're going to try and work this. OK, so this is just really the definition, OK? And I don't even want to it because then I'll get confused, but it's a systemic auto in, autoimmune inflammatory process with a predilection for the joints. The key things are inflammation, the key things are small joints, the key things are um, positive rheumatoid factor, occasionally nodules, but extra articular manifestations make it a systemic disease. No different than Crohn's disease is a small bowel disease, but we see Crohn's arthritis, we see uh, swollen knees that are Crohn's, we see sacroiliac disease that is Crohn's, and they don't have bowel disease. They may develop it just in the same way that I've seen a patient who came to the hospital with a rheumatoid factor of 500 and had um, interstitial lung disease, pleural effusion, and pulmonary nodules of unknown cause, and of course everybody screaming, they must have vasculitis, what are we going to do? But when I looked at that patient, they really weren't that sick. They were admitted with a little shortness of breath, probably from an exacerbation of pre-existing interstitial lung disease. Nobody, uh, no, nobody had worked them up. They never followed up with doctors. They were a smoker in the past. There might have been a component of COPD. Very confusing. 
That's what makes us doctors really smart. We figure out what's confusing. So anyway, um, but then the rheumatoid factor was ordered kind of randomly before I was ever involved in the case. It was the only test that came out off the wall. It was, uh, I believe it was actually on a scale where greater than 600 was the highest you can go, and that's where that person's rheumatoid factor was. So then call rheumatology, they have a positive rheumatoid factor. Nobody thinks to call rheumatology when you have this crazy picture in the lungs, but anyway, I looked at the case and I said, oh, this patient has rheumatoid arthritis involving the lungs or rheumatoid lung disease, and in fact, they had three features of rheumatoid lung disease, which at that time, 20 odd years ago, or somewhere in the beginning of my career, never been documented. I, I, done, I had done research, uh, literature reviews at that time, and to my knowledge, it was never described, and I don't know if it has ever been described, and for those of you who know, I am a little busy, and I don't always have time to write things, but suffice, I've definitely seen rheumatoid lung disease to the fullest, a patient with nodules, interstitial lung disease, and pleurisy with no arthritis, and in fact, the follow-up on this patient is about five years later developed a profound, obvious case of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, let, let's digress one more step, because this is important too. What if that patient just had the rheumatoid factor of 500, and in today's world, they have a CCP of uh, greater than 60 on some scales or greater than 250 on others? So if the person has these findings, um, the first question to ask yourself, really, what was the pretest probability of ordering the test? I mean, if you take all comers and you blood test everybody, you're going to get a false positive rate of 5% probably on any test you pick. But if they came to you and they're not feeling well, you had some pretest probability, perhaps not that they had rheumatoid arthritis, but you were shotgunning it and you ordered everything. And the only thing that turned out positive was a, a very high rheumatoid factor, or more importantly, a very high CCP. Well, if that person does not have joint disease at all, that's a case where I may actually jump to an MRI and look to see if they have any erosions that are not showing up symptomatically or uh, on a plain film. But one thing you could probably tell that patient with those numbers, you're going to develop RA. And by the way, the swelling you had in your shoulder that you thought was nothing, you may have had a palindromic onset and just never paid attention to it and it didn't bother you enough to go to the doctor. A lot of things are easy to say, a lot of things are easy to do, but to put the whole thing together is the difference between a doctor and somebody who calls themselves a doctor. Um, so, um, hmm, again, I lost my thought. Okay, um, with respect to the epidemiolo epidemiology and risk factors, women, three to one. Um, I'm not sure if that's really important or not, because if you have four people in a room, you might have two men and two women with rheumatoid arthritis, because if it's 3,000 to 1,000, all you have to do is take out that 1,000 men and say, well, there's my group of rheumatoid patients. So everything has to be in context. But overall, it's three to one women to men universally. And in fact, there are hormonal factors that are felt to be involved in the cause of rheumatoid arthritis. And the most well-known hormonal issue with respect to rheumatoid arthritis is the fact that a pregnant woman, uh, other than the female-to-male -male discordance, but a pregnant woman goes into remission 50% of the time if she has RA. And in fact, a lot of those people, perhaps half, are cured with pregnancy. So in fact, pregnancy can be a cure for rheumatoid arthritis. This is not a, a joke. It's, it's true. Um, <laughs> Um, RA, people ask me this, and it's important, is it genetic? Does it run in families? And what I usually tell people is it's not the same genetics as blue eyes. Where your parents have blue eyes, you have to have blue eyes. In this type of genetics, we have our barcode, one from our mom, one from our dad, and there's a billion chips of information in this barcode, and you inherit some sort of a mixed barcode, now you have your own, and there's a billion bits of information there. That barcode uh, is your genetic predisposition or your genetic protection. So for the people who are DR4 positive, they are, they are seemingly a more genetically at-risk group. 
like, well, okay, you're genetically at risk, and in reality, we don't know the cause, so it is theorized that a genetically predisposed individual who comes in contact with the environmental trigger, which is felt to be a virus, which has never been proven or discovered, will turn on that genetic predisposition. So there may be 25 family members with rheumatoid arthritis, but now ask yourself if that family has 25 people or 2,500 people. It's, again, it's all perspective. It's, uh, it's like a person walks into the office and they weigh 400 pounds. Are they fat? Well, I don't know, how tall are they? If they're eight feet tall, they're thin. And if they're four feet tall, they're fat. So again, genetic predisposition, think about all options. Um, so HLA-DR4, which we don't routinely check for, is probably found in at least 80% of the people that have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, again, viruses are felt to be the trigger, but it's, it's not known for sure. The other thing about this topic is that people with RA or family members with RA, they tend to have other, other autoimmunity. So if you have a, a patient who has RA and you take a good family history, there's a cousin who has lupus, there's another cousin who has Sjogren's, there's another cousin who is in the hospital with muscle weakness and they don't know why, and they, maybe they had myositis, and maybe there are other family members with lupus. But then there's four brothers or sisters who have nothing. Again, it's a genetic, genetic predisposition, not Mendelian genetics where everyone gets it. Um, the pathophysiology leads me to the way I would explain to a group of uh, residents how RA works in a black and white world. Your skin is the barrier and you have an antigen coming along and it gets to the barrier. We'll assume for the conversation that this barrier is a virus. I'm sorry, the, the antigen is a virus. It crosses the barrier somehow and it's greeted at the door by a T cell. The T cell becomes activated and now this antigen presenting cell will deliver our new friend, the enemy, the virus, the antigen, deliver them to a B cell. The delivery to the B cell sets off a chain reaction. It sets off a chain reaction of many, many events. Some of the events will lead to the complement cascade. Some of them lead to the production of TNF. Some of them lead to the production of multiple interleukins. Many, many things go on. It's the discovery of all these things going on that have led to some of the newer treatments that work so well in our diagnosis. So in the black and white world, I've just kind of dummied down the whole pathophysiology to an antigen meets a T cell. The T cell gets activated and introduces to the B cell. The B cell starts to produce antibodies and in, in, uh, starts the inflammatory cascades. So keep in mind that the mature B cell are your immunoglobulins. So they can differentiate to immu immu immunoglobulins and they can go on to plasma cells. And, but over here, the same B cell is now responding to different, or I should say, starting new inflammatory cascades which lead to complement production or consumption. Um, and for RA, TNF and interleukins. Hopefully what I'm saying jives with the slides. Uh, this slide merely says that um, one of the antibodies <coughs> produced happens to be called a rheumatoid factor. So when an antibody is produced, this is medicine 101. The antigen comes in your body, your body mounts a response. Well, what's the response made with? Whether it's hepatitis B or whichever condition you pick, it's an antibody. And in, in standard immunology, when there's a response, for example, in Lyme disease, which by the way is another differential diagnostic possibility, the IgM rises quickly and comes down quickly. The IgG rises quickly, but not as quickly, and then it stays up. 
usually giving immunity. But that doesn't apply in these diseases because people with IgG rheumatoid factors, which is a rheumatoid factor, or an IgM rheumatoid factor, which is a rheumatoid factor, they do not seem to have a difference and they certainly are not protective of you if you have these antibodies. The history we've definitely beaten to death. If you guys don't know the history, uh, I better redo the lecture. The only thing wrong with this slide, I forgot my laser pointer. Anyway, the only thing wrong with this slide is that the hips are not. Uh, There's a pointer on there, on that picture. Oh, thanks. Okay, so the only thing wrong with this picture is RA patients frequently get hip disease. Uh, many hip replacements out there are because of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, if somebody shows up in the office and they have bilateral hip disease, RA is not the first thing on my mind, but it's definitely on the list. Um, in fact, I don't really like this slide because they emphasize the large joints and they leave out the small joints. Now, the DIPs are spared in RA, DIP for distal interphalangeal, so they're spared. The PIPs are highly involved. The MCPs are the most involved, followed by the wrists. The knees are involved in everything. The ankles can be involved in everything. These guys, um, the metatarsals, metatarsal heads, are probably the most commonly involved joints in the feet because the IP joints, the most distal, which are spared like the DIPs here. Now those most distal joints are commonly involved in gout, commonly involved in psoriatic arthritis, and when seen in those conditions are commonly asymmetric. Okay, so um, here's a picture of a rheumatoid hand that shows a lot of things, but uh, according to the slide, it says PIP synovial thickening. Now, you can see there is swelling, but you can also see fullness here. So this would convince me just as much as this, that this person has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight joints that are involved. And I'm using the word involved because I don't know without touching them or feeling them if they're warm or what they are really. I don't know if I can touch a boggy synovium. I don't know if they have small effusions in these joints. But this would be a reasonably common picture for an inflammatory arthritis of which our prototype happens to be rheumatoid. You can see this picture in lupus. You can see this picture in Sjogren's. You can see this picture in ankylosing spondylitis. You can see this picture in Lyme. You can see this picture in almost any condition you can name, but definitely typical of rheumatoid. Okay, this is one of my favorite pictures, and it could be this slide or another, but this, um, this slide demonstrates multiple things. One, there's thickening of the wrist. The landmarks are distorted. You don't see the ulnar styloid. You do see a lot of thickness here. You have muscle wasting. You have radial deviation of the wrist, if you can appreciate. Everyone is familiar with ulnar deviation of the wrist, but in fact, nobody has ulnar deviation of the wrist. They have ulnar deviation of the fingers after they have radial deviation of the wrist. We also have in this slide nodules. So it would be very difficult for this person to have a diagnosis of something other than rheumatoid arthritis. If you really wanted to pick it apart and say, well, gee, you know, how do I know it's not psoriatic arthritis or gout? I'd say, well, you know, these don't look like tophus, although they could be. This distribution of joints, if it's chronic, and it obviously is because it takes a long time to get this way, it's probably not gout. I'd say, well, this is pretty darn typical of um, rheumatoid arthritis. This is a very similar slide, but it's a little bit worse, where you now have, oops, wrong button. Wait. Okay, so this is, a, this is typical, but it's, um, it's worse. 
again, you can appreciate muscle wasting a little bit. These aren't the best muscle wasting slides, but they, they definitely um, exhibit muscle wasting, thickness through the wrist. You can see that this, all the swelling out here compared with here. So you got thick wrists, you got radial deviation of the wrist with ulnar deviation, and now you're getting subluxations. And this deformity here, which is a swan neck deformity, I think is exhibited better in some of the next slides, um, is common where you get ligament, um, ligament disruption from erosions of the bone that's holding the ligaments. Um, so this is your typical swan neck deformity. If you see this, while the first thing on the exam is you'll want to uh, examine the patient because if these happen to be uh, reducible, this may be somebody with a hypermobility syndrome. This may be somebody with lupus where you have a non-erosive arthritis. But um, this is a swan neck deformity. So you have hyperextension of the PIP and extreme flexion of the DIP. And these deformities are based on erosions causing ligament laxity. Does this project at all? If not, I think I have a, another one coming up. But actually, just to mention that uh, rheumatoid nodules are the most common extra-articular manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis. And they themselves have their own differential diagnosis. So if you see a nodule and you don't know what the patient has or if they don't have an arthritis, you should biopsy the nodule. <coughs> one problem with the biopsy which the pathologic report should say there's palisading layers of neutrophils. Um, I'm sorry, palisading layers of lymphocytes. I can't remember at this point. Point is, the biopsy report will be the same for a rheumatoid nodule as it is for about 20 or 50 other conditions. So the diagnostic um, biopsy of a rheumatoid nodule if this were a child and you got a rheumatoid nodule biopsy on your pathology report, you would probably advise the family there's no rheumatoid arthritis, but it's a benign nodule and it'll go away. Uh, and that would be a, a very common scenario. And m m any of the other conditions that we've named can cause nodules. And the main differential would be gouty arthritis where you might have a gouty tophus. Let's see. So the extra-articular manifestations of RA. I mentioned cardiac, and I mentioned that there's an increased risk of coronary artery disease. Um, this is pretty much what this says. I mentioned the most common problem really is um, pericarditis. The eye, uh, and I have some photographs to show you, the most common is dry eyes. They call it secondary Sjogren's. But it's hard to differentiate sometimes primary Sjogren's with arthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis with dry eyes and dry mouth. Um, some of the more profound findings where um, I can show you pictures, people actually get um, a perforated sclera. People get um, scleritis, episcleritis, and inflammation of the sclera, which need to see an ophthalmologist, will need high dose steroids, may need surgery, may need various ocular injections, very difficult to treat, very difficult problem. Um, we didn't talk about amyloidosis, we didn't talk about Felty's. Felty's syndrome is a rheumatoid arthritis patient with splenomegaly and neutropenia. And with splenomegaly and neutropenia, they do frequently get infections. Uh, this would not be treated any different than any other rheumatoid arthritis patient, except you would put them in the category of rheumatoid patients that have a poor prognosis. Other poor prognostic indicators, which I alluded to, I'll tell you, would include high rheumatoid factor, rheumatoid nodules, um, chronicity of disease, destruction, erosions. Um, central nervous system uh, or nervous system, the uh, cervical myelopathy is really a C1, C2 problem. So I mentioned before that cervical spine involvement is seen in rheumatoid arthritis probably a lot more than what is recognized. 
we're not routinely screening cervical spines as well as we should. <clears throat> if we routinely screened all cervical spines, we'd probably find half of rheumatoid patients do have some cervical spine involvement. And the key reason is um, at C1, C2, there's an area called the preodontoid space. And with widening of the preodontoid space, you get uh, instability and subluxation of C1, C2, which can be catastrophic. And those are usually neurosurgical problems when they occur, um, or I should say, at least when they progress. Um, amyloidosis is a chronic, um, a amyloid is a protein, and this protein is produced in chronic inflammatory conditions. So uh, uh, one of the telltale findings, although I've never seen this, would be if a rheumatoid patient who you would not expect to have proteinuria like you would say in a lupus patient, if they develop um, a tremendous amount of protein, you would suspect that they might, by being a chronic patient, they might have chronic, uh, I'm sorry, they may have amyloidosis. Um, okay, neuropathy. The mononeuritis multiplex is really a vasculitic complication. So when you have mononeuritis multiplex, whether it be foot drop or any other um, nerve involved, that's a rheumatoid complication in a uh, very chronically ill, chronic, long-term rheumatoid patient who needs more aggressive treatment. Um, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is really a symptom. It's not a disease. Carpal tunnel syndrome simply says you have findings in the distribution of the median nerve. Okay, what's the cause of the problem with the median nerve? Is there an entrapment? Is there inflammation? Is there ischemia? So diabetics get carpal tunnel, they have an ischemic neuropathy. The ischemic neuropathy affects the median nerve, they have carpal tunnel symptoms. Would you operate on that person? Not necessarily. You'd inject them? Not necessarily. You'd treat the neuropathy as you would treat any other neuropathy. But in rheumatoid arthritis, would you operate? Not necessarily. You just have to treat the inflammation. You inject the carpal tunnel, you inject the wrist, both with corticosteroid preparation, you increase the level of your treatment, you hope that it goes away, because if you do surgery on a carpal tunnel patient with active RA, all you're gonna be doing is removing the flexor retinaculum, but the, the inflammation didn't go away. And so in another two months, you'll have all the inflammation pushing on the same area that you just removed the barrier, and now you have inflammation on a um, scarred nerve. Um, okay, so with regard to lungs, um, okay, pleurisy and pleural effusions are the most common, pulmonary nodules are common, interstitial lung disease is common, Kaplan syndrome, which is pneumoconiosis and nodules and coal miners is not common. Rheumatoid nodules are the most common, and vasculitis, which kind of goes with uh, mononeuritis multiplex, um, I wouldn't say it's common, but I would say I see it every year in spite of biologic therapy. And when I say in spite of biologic therapy, I mean that in spite of the fact that there is biologic therapy, not everybody uses it. This slide is uh, what I would say interesting rather than of relevance. The definition of RA had always been a small joint symmetric arthritis lasting more than six weeks, um, perhaps with nodules and um, I think pretty much that was it. Oh, and a rheumatoid factor. Um, what this kind of does is now that we have a CCP antibody, they throw the CCP antibody into the criteria and they basically say to you that um, if you have a lot of joints, then it's likely to be RA. If you have a rheumatoid factor or a CCP, it's likely to be RA. If it's gone on more than six weeks, it's likely to be RA. And if you have a CRP or a set rate elevation, it's likely to be RA. So what are my issues with this? Well, anything can cause acute phase reactants to go up, so they're, they're reasonably irrelevant. Um, but if they're high in a rheumatoid patient, 
I don't really know what they mean. Because if the guy has a runny nose that day, he may have an elevated acute phase reactin as well. The, the important thing is that any of these can be RA. Even a monoarthritis can present, uh, even RA can present as a monoarthritis. I, I've seen it. Uh, and I know other rheumatologists that have seen it. Is it common or likely? No, of course not. This is common or likely. Multiple small joints. And when you see multiple small joints, those people who are more sick, they also have multiple large joints. So to say there's a joint count of 20 or 30 joints, it's probably 40 joints. Because it's probably both shoulders, both hips, both elbows, both knees, both wrists, both ankles, in addition to four MCPs, four PIPs, another four, another four. Four, eight, 16, and that's without your feet. So you can see how the joint count can easily get up there. So if you're more than 10, you're probably more than 30. Um, again, if the CCP antibody is highly positive, somebody's gonna really have to make a strong argument what else that patient has, because it is at least 99% specific for RA. I told you some of the other um, possibilities for CCP, endocarditis, hepatitis C, lupus, phospholipids, but the titers are not going to be as high. The titers are going to be in the low positive or moderate positive range. They're not going to be off the chart. Oh. All I want to do is go to the next slide. Okay. We definitely spoke about this. Um, Okay, um, so here's our differential diagnosis of a positive rheumatoid factor. I will, let's see, I'll tell you that lupus is very common, hepatitis B and C are very common, cryoglobulinemia, albeit not common, has to be in the differential diagnosis of a positive rheumatoid factor. That being said, typically cryoglobulinemic disease gives um, a purpuric rash in the lower extremities and large joint arthritis typically in the knees and ankles. Scleroderma, if you're not familiar with, can present with hand symptoms similar to RA and can give a rheumatoid factor. Sarcoidosis, whether it involves the joints or not, may be associated with a rheumatoid factor. If you see somebody with a peculiar rash or an unusual joint disease that's come on suddenly and they're not feeling well and it's been smoldering, don't ever um, <coughs> leave out endocarditis because that is definitely a possibility for a cause of a rheumatoid factor. And in one case report that I found last night, a CCP antibody, albeit not off the charts. Um, myositis is just another autoimmune disease and I guess you can just throw it on the list. Um, this is a reasonably good list. I think there's probably other things, but um, I just can't think of them at the moment. Oh, okay. The other things that I think that should be on this list that are important would be monoclonal immunoglobulin deposition diseases, multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's, um, amyloid. So if you have a high rheumatoid factor, nothing makes sense, you've got to do an SPEP. And, and that's not rare. That's, that's not like cryoglobulinemia rare. That's, that's, we see it once a week. Um, okay, so this is your kind of basic differential diagnosis. Oops. Okay, so psoriatic arthritis, um, not to go into a long discussion of psoriatic arthritis, but one of the five types of arthritis seen with psoriatic arthritis is a rheumatoid mimic. Um, gouty arthritis chronically can easily look like rheumatoid arthritis. Infectious arthritis, if it were to mimic rheumatoid arthritis, at least bacterial infection, would probably have to be seen in endocarditis where you have a systemic multi-organ disease. Um, because usually in infectious arthritis, you'd think of a monoarthritis, you'd think of gonococcal or meningococcal arthritis. Um, the viral arthritis, parvo, is gonna mimic RA and mimic lupus. In the board question, they usually say there's a 
24-year-old teacher or a 24-year-old at home with her kids, and she has an ANA of 1 to 40, which you should know is negative. They have um, polyarthritis, six weeks duration, or maybe they'll say four weeks duration because they don't want you to be lured into thinking it's RA, and they have synovitis of their PIPs and MCPs. Spondyloarthropathy encompasses ankylosing spondylitis, writer's or reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. Some people throw sarcoid into that category. You can ex expand it to Whipple's disease. Um, th these can all present with multiple joints. Polymyalgia rheumatica is, in the layman's way, like rheumatoid arthritis of the muscles of the proximal girdles. It involves the neck and shoulders. It involves the hip and buttocks. Uh, usually the rheumatoid factor is negative, which is one of the distinguishing features. Some people believe that rheumatoid arthritis, well, I'm sorry, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis for the few that exist are actually polymyalgia rheumatica. The polymyalgia patient tends to present only after 55 years old. It's more common in whites than blacks. Some literature says it doesn't occur in blacks at all, but that's completely false. I, myself and many colleagues have seen it in blacks. Um, but it's something to consider when a when a polymyalgia patient who's been treated for two to five years can't be weaned off steroids, then it's time to start thinking, oh, well, maybe they really didn't have polymyalgia, maybe it presented in that fashion, and maybe, in fact, they have RA. Um, I think I pretty much beat this one to death. Uh, let's see. You know, um, it used to be, um, this is the crippling arthritis and this is the regular arthritis. Well, since we treat this one so well, I'm not so sure this isn't now the crippling arthritis. And this is just me speaking. I haven't read this anywhere and I haven't published it, nor has anyone else that I've seen. But in reality, these people t tend to do very well. Uh, 30 years ago, 35% of these people were crippled, no matter what was done to them. Um, these people, tend to be getting joint replacements all the time. So I don't know which one's worse. The treatments here are very good, but they come with some risk of side effect. The treatments here haven't changed in 30 years, except joint replacements have become um, more mainstay, and sur some surgeons who are good at doing them can get the people back on their feet and you know having a normal life. Um, actually, that leads me to well, we should probably just, I don't know how much time we have, but we should definitely talk about treatment at least. I think I've beaten everything else to death with, uh, with RA. So, oh, I, okay, lucky me. Um, okay, so treatment of RA uh, would start with the patient probably going to the family doctor and failing NSAIDs. And then the patient comes to the rheumatologist and some people, I'd say the rheumatology community is divided on corticosteroids. I'm, I'm one of the half that believes in using corticosteroids. I believe that it's another way of lowering inflammation and if the dose is kept low, that your side effect risk is very low. I believe that if you're a diabetic and the sugars go up, that's why we have insulin, we can regulate your sugars. I believe that if your cholesterol is a problem, we should monitor it and treat it. I believe that if hypertension is a problem, we can monitor it and treat it. Because most of these people have these problems anyway. When they say, oh, he caused my high blood pressure or he caused my diabetes, you didn't cause anything. These are usually out of shape, overweight, and they just have bad protoplasm, and they're going to get these metabolic syndromes. So to add 5 milligrams of prednisone and improve their quality of life so that they can possibly walk or swim or do something, I think that probably outweighs the fact that they are already somebody with a metabolic syndrome who's going nowhere fast. Um, these sedentary people, they just don't do well. So before I even talk about the medications, um, physical therapy is important, muscle strengthening, stretching, toning, uh, stretching of, to keep contractures away. These are all very important modalities, using braces, splints, occupational therapy, all very important, often overlooked. Even by rheumatologists, they can be overlooked. A lot depends on where you practice, who is near your practice, what's your access to a good therapist, what's your access to a good surgeon. What do you do if you have a tendon rupture? If you have a tendon rupture, it's a surgical emergency to some degree, because if you wait more than 48 hours, they can't reconnect the tendon. But if you don't have a good surgeon who does that problem, you have a big problem. 
and then you're transporting the patient. So th there's a lot of factors that go into this. Okay, so let's just talk about the medical aspect now with regard to drugs that we use for rheumatoid arthritis. Our mainstay in rheumatoid arthritis for over 30 years is methotrexate. All rheumatoid arthritis patients are on methotrexate. Methotrexate is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, therefore it blocks folic acid. We therefore give all methotrexate patients one milligram of folic acid every day. There are some rheumatologists that seem to stop it on the day that they give the methotrexate because methotrexate is given once a week. I don't believe in that. I give it seven days a week, one milligram, never had a problem with it. Excuse me. Um, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, methotrexate was used in psoriasis by dermatologists and there was so much fear about the drug, they would not put you on methotrexate unless you had a liver biopsy. There are still dermatologists practicing today that will not give methotrexate without a liver biopsy. This is a problem. There are some people that either don't keep up with their CME or just kind of don't get it. Methotrexate is really safe. It may not be as safe as Plaquenil, but it's really safe. Um, you can read that there's methotrexate lung toxicity. It's extraordinarily rare, and there's even debate if it exists. There's methotrexate liver disease. It's extraordinarily rare. That does exist. It's proven liver biopsy, etc. You will find many more of your patients have fatty liver disease with transaminase elevations than have methotrexate toxicity drug, it's more to appease the patient. Um, okay, methotrexate's onset of action is about six weeks, but today, unlike 30 years ago, we just give 10, 15, 20 right off the bat. There's no right starting dose. There may be somewhere, and it may say 15 <coughs> milligrams. I'm not certain about that quickly start my rheumatoids that are going to be on methotrexate on 20 milligrams and I leave them I follow up with them in six weeks and see how they're making out making out pretty well the biggest problem I think with methotrexate is the diarrhea and nausea and for those patients I split the dose up instead of telling them to take eight pills at one time I say take four in the morning and four in the evening other ways to split it up or you can give it as a liquid uh, you don't have to give it but you can you can give it with Compazine, you can give it with Zofran. Many ways to get around the one out of 150 people that has some sort of a benign side effect from methotrexate because it's important to use methotrexate. So if methotrexate uh, can for whatever reason, you have other options before you get to the biologic. So by the way, methotrexate these days is called a non-biologic DMARD. And by the way, non-biologic DMARD Aquanil, gold, which we don't use anymore, penicillamine, which we don't use um, Imuran, which we do use occasionally in rheumatoid, we use it in myositis, we use it in, in other rheumatic conditions. Zareva or leflunamide, leflunamide, leflunamide. Um, really, I, I have some experience with it, but because methotrexate is so well tolerated, I don't use it that much. The starting dose is a loading dose of 100 milligrams a day for three days, followed by, I think the literature or the package insert is 10 milligrams and you titrate to 20. With a few people that I've used it, usually it's 100 milligrams daily for three days, followed by uh, 20 milligrams a day. Toxicity is, with that drug, again, this is more for the boards to know, that the toxicity is treated with Questran or... Um, the, I think it's Questran, the cholesterol drug, and it will pull the, the drug out of the system. Um, so we have our person who's now on methotrexate. Um, how they're doing depends on what we do next. How they're doing these days in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, we by what their x-ray findings, their findings, their bone loss, and their functionability are. Because Project DMARDS, it's been proven that we can improve quality of care, we can function, we can probably reverse some disease. Um, the biologic drugs are good at um, altering osteoporosis. We can actually, it is felt, 
repair portions that have been created by the osteoclast activation rheumatoid patient who in the inflammatory cascades that I mentioned also leads to osteoclast activation. So we get to <laughs> So um, the first thing to know uh, residency level is that biologics exist, okay? So biologics, you've heard of them. There's embryo, um, there's a whole slew of them. So I'm gonna break them up. There's TNF inhibitors. TNF is tumor necrosis or TNF alpha. So the inhibitors of TNF, which are embryo, remicade, Umera, which is um, symp symponi. Um, so it's antaricept is enbrol, infliximab is adalimumab is umera, and mentioned. Those block TNF. Or a beta sept is a T cell modulator. Now remember, the antigen comes in, okay? meets the T cell before it ever gets to the B cell. What the co-stimulatory module does, it actually blocks both pathways of B mediation. So it can block people who have TNF mediated or people with interleukin mediated disease. Because I just told you TNF blockers, I didn't get to it, but there's also interleukin blockers. digress because I feel like I've gone out of order. So we have our and we do have interleukin blockers. So the interleukin blockers, we have an IL-1 blocker. This drug is not more effective than in rheumatoid arthritis. It may be well used in still, but it's definitely not in RA, but probably as a substitute for methotrexate, but not to be combined with other biologics due to the inherent risk of side effect namely infection. Um, and then there's toclizumab, which is Actemra, which is IL. Then we have rituxan or rituximab, which is cell blocker. Then we have Orencia, which is a beta, which is the T cell co-stimulatory blocker. Later. Okay, so we don't know which path people have with regard to their RA. You know most people respond to any of the drugs. We do know that if a patient either fails one TNF, they can switch to another uh, drug within the class and still get benefit. We do know that after years or a of being on one, they may develop tolerance. No way of predicting who's going to respond to which class. How do you pick one class over another becomes your patient population, your what your availability of different drugs are, and cost. So I mentioned all. Now, now let me just give a blanket on the side effects. Generically, what you need to know, practically, I should say, is that all the drugs should be when somebody has an infection needs to be screened for TB. Everybody needs a history because if they've been in an area where there is a hysteresis, uh, coccidioide mycosis, river basins, the San Joaquin Valley, etc., where you can pick a that is similar to TB, you need to be screened for these things. Because the use of these biologic drugs will activate TB or these funguses. So the Prevention. Okay, so we, we do our due diligence for these people don't have uh, predisposition to the drug, and if so, we refer to the ID guy. The ID guy gives not INH, uh, INH and um, B6, and it's okay, they're clear to take Remicade or whatever the drug may be. Now, people always say, oh gosh, you know, what about risk? Well, for one, there's a higher risk of malignant in RA patients than the general population. But 10 years now or more, there is no increased risk of malignancy, not lymphoma or anything else in the biologic population 
than in the non-biologic population. So the RA risk than the general population, but the RA patients on biologics are risk of any malignancy than are the people who are trexate. And by the way, for the record, one thing for the boards is they can give a pseudo lymphoma. So if somebody on methotrexate on the board a lymphadenopathy, the answer is stop the methotrexate. In fact, on if there's anything to do with a drug, the answer is always stop the drug. Almost a guarantee. Um, and usually if you learn something, you should say, oh, I didn't know that drug did that. But it usually is. Um, okay, so we do not infuse a drug condone a person injecting themselves with the drug, a person has an active infection pretty much defined as they need antibiotics or they have a fever. So if he has um, green mucus, uh, he has a UTI on antibiotics, if somebody has diabetes where they're in the hospital, you, you can hold their biological. It's, it's debatable whether or not you hold their 5 milligrams of prednisone it's debatable whether or not you have to hold their methotrexate, but it's not debatable. If you have an active infection, you don't give biologics. But that's the time that you have to stop it. I'm not convinced <laughs> that you have to stop biologics for surgery because nobody has ever suggested they uh, impede healing. Methotrexate may impede healing, but my argument for not stopping methotrexate is as follows. It takes the drug out of the system. The surgeons tell the people to stop the drug, so they haven't really stopped the drug. Uh, if you were to truly stop the drug prior to uh, surgery and you stopped it three months before, now you'd be operating on a knee replacement where there's so much inflammation you can't perform the patient because you're sowing chopped meat and everything is inflamed. So there has to be a give and take. Surgeons say, oh, I'm not going these drugs, I'm saying if you take them off the drugs, you can't operate. It's not because I don't want you to, it's because it won't be possible. Okay, so those are some controversial issues. Um, somewhere on some website, it gives formal recommendations how and why and when you should time the surgery with regard to stopping the biologic DMARD. I really don't agree that you need to stop them. I, I really don't, do not may in fact change. The only time they won't change is when you have vaccines with these drugs. So the live vaccine are most um, involved with would be shingles vaccine. What we try to do is we try to vaccinate with a chronic disease like RA immediately. So this way, three months later, if we need to have them on a drug with the vaccine, they're already vaccinated. And that's even Five years old, just because the guideline says you're supposed to be over, well, they may change the guideline and say it's 50. So some of these people may have the vaccine because they do need the vaccine. They need the vaccines, they need flu vaccines, every vaccine that they can need prior to going on a drug that has something to do with, you know. And even though I don't see a lot of shingles attack patients, you know, if we can prevent the three. That would that would be a good thing. Okay, so so there's there's T there's interleukin blockers IL one and IL six cell blocker which essentially blocks the pathway of both T as well as interleukin. Which you might say, oh well, that's the best one. It blocks. Well, not necessarily. We don't know why it doesn't, but it doesn't. And you might say, well, rituxan that gets rid of all the B cells lupus, but it didn't. So certain things don't necessarily make sense. Um, I could probably go further in depth onto the and so on, but um, I think that's a good um, start for this group. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them. Yes? The question is, in, in the patient that I talked about before that had 
I'm sorry, that had rheumatoid lung without RA, did I start treatment in that patient at that time? The answer to your question is, the correct thing to would be to start treatment, probably in that patient with a lot of it, and depending on how bad the interstitial is, perhaps cytoxan. Um, and when you have somebody who has a lot of interstitial lung disease, to give consideration to pneumocystis prophylaxis before you go to So, in that patient, almost 20 years ago, the patient reached out to me after they had the arthritis. I gave them, they never followed up, they kept going to pulmonary, and at that time, were not so readily available. They were starting out. But if that person came today, they would need a complete pulmonary evaluation to find out what their interstitial lung disease is, because that would trump the other problems, I think. The pleurisy is easily treatable with some steroid, even low dose. Individuals are not necessarily important unless one of them is malignant. Anyway, another question for the boards, if you have a pulmonary nodule who's a rheumatoid who gets a new nodule, the answer is biopsy because it could be lung cancer. But um, you're raising a great point, and yeah, today I would definitely treat it aggressively, absolutely. So if you're seeing somebody that you're newly diagnosing with arthritis, so what your therapy, do you initially start them with prednisone? And is that what you're saying? So methotrexate is going to take time to work. So you're going to prednisone as well. So these are kind of stepwise. So, um, repeat the question to everyone, um, basically on the first visit with a new rheumatoid patient. And good question, and I want to first mention something that I forgot that you just reminded me of. One of our jobs now, since we have such good treatment, is there's proof that if you treat early, very early, as early as possible, you can prevent, and you can prevent joint destruction, and you can prevent disability. Treat them very aggressively and very fast. On the first I definitely start prednisone mm -hmm. or methylprednisolone. <coughs> and I give them a high dose. And I usually bring them to because I want to lower the dose as fast as possible. I don't start methotrexate on the first dose unless I'm 100% it's a rheumatoid diagnosis because I don't want this person committing for methotrexate if they really don't need it. But in general, if it was a black and white world and the patient they absolutely have RA. Yes, on day one, I will start in that scenario prednisone with methotrexate. Absolutely. Six weeks, I will then have gathered enough information, perhaps a hand and wrist MRI, and if they have erosions, they're going on a. And actually, I wanted to um, mention um, believe it or not, uh, and I, I brought something. Um, this is the medical letter. Um, from February 2014, and they talk about the cost of the biologic. Enbrel, Remicade, Umera, Symphony, Simsia, and they Valera, which is an interleukin blocker that was, um, or is approved now, this is sensoriatic arthritis. What, what I find really these are the prices based on psoriatic use, and in psoriatic use, the drug doses so taking into account that Remicade is the usable drug, even at the higher dose, which is 5 milligram, not 3 milligram per kilogram, it is significantly more than 20% than either the comparable dose of Enbrel, Umera, or Simsia, and Stellara, according to this letter, which you're welcome to look at. Um, so to answer your question, I hope I did. Uh, so how do you start prednisone, for instance? If it's has really bad joint disease and they've been suffering like crazy, I'll start on the equivalent of 20 milligrams of prednisone to get them down to five or less if possible. Because there's no reason for them to suffer. And the difference of suffering and not suffering is five milligrams of prednisone, definitely leave them on the five milligrams of prednisone. Anything wrong with that. Yes? So, uh, when would you like to start? Like, how much of this workup should we do before we send 
I think in reality, um, if you if you see somebody and they have um, whether it's one joint or more than one joint, you give them Motrin and you say, you know, look, if you take it, it goes away, it was probably a virus. You don't need to go to a specialist. On for more than two weeks, I would then. And I would probably do work. I'd probably just get on my initial blood draw, you know, CBC chemistry factor. And I wouldn't go into the whole uh, stuff because usually when they get to me, I'm in tests. And if you ordered a million tests, two, I still have to repeat the whole panel plus the two. So I would probably, you know, see him, put him on an NSAID said with Tylenol, but get a feel for if you think this is chronic or go away. Once you think that this is not going away, diagnose quickly. They need to have a joint tapped. We need to prove if it's we even we need to look at the SI joints. Maybe it's psoriatic. Many psoriatics have rheumatoid factor. So faster than slower. Anything else? Okay. Diagnostic or helpful in the correct. Oh, the question was: Is a bio of a rheumatoid nodule diagnostic? Um, no, it is not necessarily diagnostic. But in a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis <coughs> and they have a nodule, uh, you know, when you see them, you don't know if that's a tophus, you don't know if that's a, you don't know if that's a rheumatoid nodule. And it's important sometimes to find out. I would not recommend nodules because they grow back. You only resect them, become infected. If they're constantly infected, um, there's some structural issue where they cannot put their ball, or you know, there has to be a real reason, not just oh, that's a off. Because then you have to explain to the person, you're going to get more than likely. And and one of the problems, problem is methotrexate enhances nodules. It them. The mechanism of rheumatoid nodules is not the same rheumatoid arthritis. It's much more poorly understood. That's why you can biopsy uh, you know, a kid who has nodules and the pathology will be a rheumatoid nodule. Diagnosis is benign nodules. And you will see rheumatoid nodules or subcutaneous nodules with a um, biopsy that mimics rheumatoid nodules in probably a hundred conditions. So when you see rheumatoid nodule as the answer on a pathology sheet, uh, if it went to Quest or some, you know, local lab, it's a, uh, if you get it to a place like Columbia, you could talk to the person who did the biopsy and tell them the scenario, then you can actually have a discussion as to how that nodule fits into the diagnosis. Anyone else? My brain still one on it if I was a cell phone. <laughs> okay, well, questions, I guess we're done. Welcome.